Friday, November 22nd. It all began so beautifully. After a drizzle in the morning, the sun came out bright and beautiful. We were going into Dallas. In the lead car, President and Mrs. Kennedy, John and Nellie, and then a Secret Service car full of men, and then our car, Lyndon and me, and Senator Yarbrough. The streets were lined with people, lots and lots of children, all smiling, placards, confetti, people waving from windows. One last happy moment I had was looking up and seeing Mary Griffith leaning out of a window, waving at me. Then almost at the edge of town, on our way to the trade mart where we were going to have the luncheon, we were rounding a curve, going down a hill. Suddenly, there was a sharp, loud report, a shot seemed to me to come from the right above my shoulder from a building. Then one moment and then two more shots in rapid succession. There'd been such a gala air that I thought it must be firecrackers or some sort of celebration. Then, in the lead car, the Secret Service men were suddenly down. I heard over the radio system, let's get out of here. An ISS man who was with us, Ruth Youngblood, I believe it was, vaulted over the front seat on top of Lyndon, threw him to the floor and said, get down. Senator Yarber and I ducked our heads. The cars accelerated terrifically fast, faster and faster. Then suddenly, they put on the brakes so hard that I wondered if they were going to make it, as they wheeled left around a corner, we pulled up to a building. I looked up and saw it said, Hospital. Only then did I believe that this might be what it was. Yarbrough kept on saying in an excited voice, Have they shot the people? Have they shot the president? I said, something like, no, can't be. As we ground to a halt, we were still the third car. The Secret Service men began to pull, lead, guide, hustle us out. I cast one last look back over my shoulder and saw a bundle of pink, just like a, a drift blossom lying in the back seat. I, I think it was Mrs. Kennedy lying over the president's body. They led us to the right, to the left, onward into a quiet room in the hospital. Very small room. It was lined with white sheets, I believe. People came and went. Kenny O'Donnell, Congressman Thornberry, Congressman Jack Brooks, always uh, there was Ruth right there, and Marie Roberts, Jerry Kivett, Lynn Johns, Woody Taylor. There was talk about where would we go? Back to Washington, 
to the plane, to our house. People spoke of how widespread this may be. Throughout it all, London was remarkably calm and quiet. He said we'd better move the plane to another part of the field. He spoke of going back out to the plane in black cars. Every face that came in, you searched for the answers that you must know. I think the face I kept on seeing it on was the face of Kenny O'Donnell, who loved him so much. It was Lyndon, as usual, who thought of it, although I wasn't going to leave without doing it. He said, you'd better try to see if you can see Jackie and Nellie. We didn't know what had happened to John. I asked the Secret Service if I could be take them, taken to them. Uh, they began to lead me. Up one corridor, back stairs, down another. Suddenly, I found myself face to face with Jackie. In a small hall, I think it was right outside, the operating room. You always think of her, or somebody like her, as being insulated, protected, uh, sort of on a levels. She was quite alone. I don't think I ever saw anybody so much alone in my life. I went up to her, put my arms around her, and said something, I'm sure it was quite banal, like, God help us all, because my feelings for her were too tumultuous to put into words. And then I went in to see Nellie. There it was different, because Nellie and I have gone through so many things together since about 1938. I hugged her tight, and we both cried, and I said, Nellie, it's going to be all right. There's been enough bad that's already happened. It wasn't only the president I was thinking about. It was Kathleen, of course. And Nellie said, yes, John's going to be all right among her many other fine qualities. She is also tough. Then I turned and went back to that, the small white room where Lyndon still was. Mr. Kilduff and Kenny O'Donnell were coming and going. I think it was from Kenny's face and from Kenny's voice that I first heard the words, the president is dead. Mr. Kildoff entered and said to Lyndon, Mr. President, it was decided that we could go immediately to the airport. Quick plans were made about how to get to the car, who to ride in what, getting out of that hospital, into the cars, was one of the swiftest walks I ever made. We got in, then and said stop the sirens. We drove along as fast as we could. I looked up at a building, and there already, there was a flag at half-mast. I think that was when the enormity of what had happened first struck me. When we got to the airplane, we, went, we entered 
airplane number one for the first time. There was a TV set on. The commentator was saying, Lyndon B. Johnson, now President of the United States, they were saying that they had a suspect. They were not sure that he was the assassin, that the President had been shot the 30-30 rifle. All the plane, the shades on the plane were lowered. We heard that we were going to wait for Mrs. Kennedy and for the coffin. There was discussion about when London should be sworn in as president. There was a telephone call to Washington, I believe, to the Attorney General. It was decided that he should be sworn in there in Dallas as quickly as possible because of international implications and because we did not know how wide, whether this was an incident there only, or whether it had a wider spread as to the intended victims. Judge Sarah Hughes, a federal judge in Dallas, and I'm glad it was she, was called to come in a hurry we borrowed a Bible. Mrs. Kennedy had arrived by that time and the coffin. And there, in the very narrow confines of the plane, with Jackie on his left, her hair falling in her eyes, but very composed, and then Lyndon, and I was on his right, Judge Hughes with the Bible in front of him, and a cluster of Secret Service people and congressmen we'd known a long time. Lyndon took the oath of office. It's odd at a time like that, at the very... <sighs> the little things that come to you and the moment of deep compassion you have for people who are really not at the center of the tragedy. I heard a Secret Service man say in the most desolate voice and I and I heard for him we've never lost a president in the service. And then when Police Chief Curry of Dallas came on the plane and said to Mrs. Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, believe me, we did everything we possibly could. God, that was a brave thing for that man to do. We all sat around in the plane, but rather speechless. Mrs. Kennedy, we had been quickly ushered first into the main private presidential cabin, out of which we very quickly got to when we saw where we were, because that is where Mrs. Kennedy should be. The casket was in the hall. I went in to see Mrs. Kennedy, and I don't Oh, it was a very, very hard thing to do. She made it as easy as possible. She said things like, Oh, Lady Bird, it's always good. We've liked you, too, so much. She said, I remember other things she said. Oh, what if I had not been there? I am so glad I was there. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained with blood. 
one leg was almost entirely covered with it. And her right glove was caked, that immaculate woman. It was caked with blood, her husband's blood. She always wore gloves like she was used to them. I never could. And that was somehow one of the most poignant sights. Exquisitely dressed and caked in blood. I asked her if I couldn't get somebody to come in to help her change. And she says, oh no, that's all right. Perhaps later I'll ask for Mary Gallagher but not right now. And then with something, if with a person that gentle, that dignified, you can say, had an element of fierceness, she said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. She said a lot of other things that made it so much easier for us. Like, oh, Ladybird, We've all liked you both so much. I tried to express something of how we felt. I said, oh, Mrs. Kennedy, you know we never even wanted to be vice president. And now, dear God, it's come to this. Well, I would have given anything to help her. And there was nothing I could do to help her. So rather quickly, I left and went back to the airplane, to the main part of the room where everybody was seated. The ride to Washington was silent and strained, each with his own thoughts. One of mine was something I had said about Lyndon in an interview a long time ago that he's a good man in a tight spot. I even remember one little thing he said in that hospital room. Tell the children, get a secret service man with them. Finally, we got to Washington. There was a cluster of people watching. Many bright lights. The casket went off first, and Mrs. Kennedy and the family who had come to join them. And then we followed. Lyndon made a very simple, very brief, and I think appealing and strong talk to the folks there. Only about four sentences, I believe. We got in cars, we dropped him off in a hurry at the White House, and I came home. 